Let's see. Oh, this is live. Uh, it's always a uh, stressful experience. All right, I'm checking the chat. Can everyone hear me? Slash see me. And maybe I need a hat. Let's see. It's a lot of hair. Okay, can you hear me, everyone? Okay. See a lot of chat. Can you hear me? All right, I'll just wait a couple of minutes to get started here. Goodness gracious. That is a lot of hair. I'm not used to seeing myself these days. <laughs> um, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, got a lot of questions that we've been collecting just in the chat the past couple of days. Uh, I'll try and answer some of them as many as I can, try and answer questions that are coming in now. Uh, but also, you know, there's just too many to get to all of them. So there's definitely some themes, some common questions, that sort of thing that we'll get to. Uh, a lot of questions around my pets, a lot of questions about courses, updates to courses, new courses, uh, and then also just about web development, career stuff in general. Um, Oh dear, it's echoing, huh? I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> Let's see. Which mic is it using? I'm sorry if it's echoing everyone. Okay, so um, hello everyone, it's Colt. Uh, I am coming from uh, the dying days of my time in, in the Bay Area, for now at least. Uh, I'm actually in the middle of packing. Um, there's a reason all my walls are empty and the camera is very much angled up because the ground is littered in boxes. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of packing. Um, so some of you have been asking, actually where I am is not extremely hot right now in the Bay Area. It's been like the one pocket uh, because the geography that has not been insanely hot. Uh, it's been a lot, a lot more moderate uh, compared to other parts of the West Coast. However, a couple of weeks ago is disastrously hot. I don't have air conditioning here and my house is at like 102 degrees at the inside. Um, I basically just sat outside all day. It was not pleasant, but can't complain. Um, things are fine. Uh, I am in the middle of moving. I've talked about that a, a little bit on, on YouTube or uh, also on Udemy and some of my answers that I've been posting to students. Um, it's definitely kind of screwing things up a little bit in terms of productivity and making courses, uh, but I'm working on it. I've got some new courses coming out. But what I wanna talk about right now is mostly just your questions, um, sort of uh, answering hopefully as many as we can from the chat. And the first one, that somebody asked in, a couple of people asked this about my pets. Uh, my pets, I never know. I mean, some people were around from the early days when I had Rusty. Rusty's no longer with us, unfortunately. Very sad, um, really t terrible situation. He was got this really rare blood disease at like six years old and had to put him down, unfortunately. I've got my two cats though, and I've got my chickens. Also sad news about my chickens though. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is a depressing start. Um, uh, a bobcat got in and, and got three of my chickens a couple weeks ago, like, more like a month, month and a half ago. That was a horrible sight, uh, but everyone, um, well, I was gonna say everyone's fine. That is not the case. Half of my chickens are definitely not fine. <laughs> They're, they uh, sadly did not survive. Um, one, one of my roosters heroically battled them off, uh, but everyone else is uh, new. I got some new replacements. They're, they're, they're working on uh, becoming pets. It's kind of a weird thing with chickens. You, if you raise them from chicks, they really are like pets and you kind of take care of them. But a lot of them obviously are agricultural animals. They just produce eggs until you can get them as adults and they're not at all like a pet. So I've got a mixture of these days, to be honest. The, the ones that I raised from eggs are actually uh, by far the friendliest, but I also lost a couple of them. So that was horrible. I fixed up the coop though. My pets are good. Blue, my cat is still around. Uh, she is 
getting old. She's got some arthritis. She's she's uh, not super mobile, um, but she's fine, relatively healthy otherwise. Um, okay, so uh, moving on to some more substantial questions. As much as I love to tell you about the tragedies around my pets, uh, there's a couple things. I mean, this year has obviously been crazy. The last I mean, year and a half. Uh, in so many ways and it's changed the world and you know i'm not going to say anything <laughs> novel on that every uh every tv commercial these days uh is saying something about how much we've changed and how much we've come together and blah 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 but really what i want what i want to focus on is in web development and software engineering in um, a lot of the jobs that probably a lot of you are looking at things have drastically changed uh as far as what's possible at remote work um, especially for entry level roles is now common. It's still tough to get a job. It's still tough to, you know, break into the, the, uh, software engineering industry, but lots and lots of the students I'm working with, a lot of the students uh, that I've had graduate, you know, I don't track, I don't have statistics for my Udemy courses on graduates and where they're going and how many students get jobs. And it's obviously very loosely organized because a lot of students don't even really make it to the end of a course, especially when courses are like 60 hour, uh, death marches sometimes, um, but uh, both for the, the boot camps that I've worked with and for the springboard course that I launched a couple, what, a year and a half ago almost, uh, back in January of 2020, um, we have seen tons and tons of students getting remote jobs. And that was always a, basically a pipe dream, something students would ask about. Is it possible for me to get a remote job? I want to stay where I am, but I want to have a higher salary. I want to support my family. And usually the answer was something like, you're gonna have to wait until you have your first couple jobs and maybe find the right boss or then apply for a remote role. But it was definitely not the norm. Um, I don't know how long that's gonna you know, be the case. There's definitely plenty of complications that some of these students are reporting um, just in terms of onboarding and getting, you know, getting used to being a developer is tough. Uh, if you have coworkers around you and you can turn to your, your coworker and ask questions, it's tougher if it's just you at home. But of course, there's plenty of benefits to remote work. Um, so it's definitely a mixed bag, but most of the students, uh, I have numbers just from the springboard grads uh, that, that we've been tracking. And the vast majority are doing remote jobs as their very first role, which is definitely, I mean, I don't know how I'd feel about it as a student. You don't have a choice, at least uh, in the US these days. I mean, it's gonna be changing, but um, pros and cons, absolutely exciting for some students to be able to, st to live where they live and work for a company based in New York or the Bay Area or internationally. Um, but as I mentioned, there's there's some downsides. When you're just starting out, you've got to be pretty resilient. You've got to be able to rely on um, coworkers over Slack or chat or setting up Zoom calls. And it's not always the same. Um, and definitely a, a much better or a much bigger sense of being on your own is, is probably more common. I only talked to a couple of students about it, but they all mentioned some exacerbated insecurity at the beginning. Um, but now, you know, it's kind of a, a, a mixed bag, I'd say, for students. And I can't, I feel bad, like, making pronouncements about, oh, it's going to be this or that, or everybody loves it, or everyone's doing remote work. I've talked to, you know, just a couple students out of the ones that I know have gotten jobs. Um, but just looking at the data, I can say the majority of our students are getting remote jobs. I don't know how much that will change. Uh, now, some other sort of categories of questions here are around um, changing careers, um, and especially people who are changing careers like in the middle, like 30s to 40s or even older. Um, I think a lot of people in that age group have concerns uh, that somehow, I mean, I guess it makes sense that it, you could tell yourself that it's harder uh, to change careers and get a, a you know, a developer job as a 30 or 40 year old than it is to get your first ever job as a 20 year old graduating college. But I don't think that's really the case. I, I'd say it's actually um, from a, a hiring perspective, um, easier to hire somebody if they have other work experience, even if it's in a totally different industry. If somebody did marketing or uh, someone was in the military, they have a story, they've got a narrative they can sort of pitch to you. Um, they can talk about why they're making a transition. Um, if you're just out of college or you're a brand new student, plenty of jobs available to you as well. Uh, but it, you definitely have to work harder to stand out a bit. That's not to say that 
uh, anybody's going to have an incredibly easy time getting a job or that you just have to show up and, <laughs> and just tell a story. It's competitive. It's, uh, you're going to have definite uh, nose and heartbreak along the way, possibly. But uh, in terms of just trends and the students that we see getting jobs, I don't actually am checking the, the data that we have here. I don't know if we have average age. That would be one, one thing to keep track of. But just the students I've talked with and met with, um, most of them are changing careers. We have some people that, you know, a lot of people take my courses who are high school students or just curious, but a lot of people uh, are in their 30s and 40s. And I think actually, all right, I just got a message. Our average age right now is 35 for the, the students that are graduating and getting jobs. Um, so we have students who are much older. I've worked with students who are in their 60s and a couple in their low 70s uh, who actually did get jobs, um, although this was a couple of years ago. Um, and that was in an in-person program. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of rambling, but um, it's just me talking to my computer like always. No real, uh, <laughs> nobody else on the other side that's talking back. I mean, I see the chat, but it is very much a weird experience just to talk to a bunch of people, um, especially when uh, this chat just like scrolls by and I, I can't even uh, keep track of it. So, um, Somebody asked, and this is something I've seen a couple times. I did a, a thing on Facebook yesterday, front end versus back end. How do you decide? How do you know where you fit? Um, that's uh, a hard one. I'll, I think I've said this before to my students. Um, I always thought I wanted to do front end and that was what I was gonna be good at, what I wanted to do. It's more visual. And, and that's definitely the more common instinct is to think front end is for you because it's what you interact with as a human, as a non-developer. But um, I actually definitely was wrong. <laughs> Once I learned more about both and had experience just writing some simple backend code, uh, I definitely prefer that part. And that was just my experience. I see that transition happen a lot. People come in, I'm gonna do front end. I wanna make beautiful websites. Then they get to the intricacies of CSS layout or grid systems and Flexbox. They have to worry about responsive design. And suddenly it becomes more of a slog for some people. Um, that was definitely my experience. Other people will have you know, a different uh, experience. I don't know if many people who come in gung-ho about backend right away. It definitely is less approachable upfront, uh, but overall I, I see students kind of not knowing and, and having to decide or figure it out on the job and that's pretty normal. Whatever your first role is, if you're asking front end versus back end, um, I'll assume you are either very new or don't have a job yet. Whatever that first role is, there's going to be dumb postings saying, you know, full stack, entry level full stack, which is just kind of absurd. Um, if the requirements are asking you to be familiar with all parts of the stack, um, that is just a ridiculous for any engineer, but especially a brand new one. But if the requirements are more, or if the the full stack part of that job description is more about you having opportunities to work across the entire stack and figure out sort of who you are as a developer, figure out what you care about, then that's a great entry level role. Um, most companies are going to want to place you in a, within their own structure where you're gonna excel, where you will succeed the most. And so that could mean after your first year or two, you wanna give a shot or you wanna give back end a shot or you wanna try jumping to the team that's writing Python or the team that is writing uh, I mean, I've had students who, who went from web to iOS or from web to Android. Um, but most of the time, the students that I talk with and keep in touch with um, will start doing a bunch of JavaScript, CSS, and then switch over to something back end. Or, I mean, there's many that just stick with what they like. Um, but when it comes to deciding, I think it's just hard. It's all of this is you can teach, you can learn the basics, but you're not going to know really what you like until you're actually on the job. You can get an inkling and, and sort of prefer one or the other at home or on your own side projects, um, but you kind of have to do it all when you're one person. Once you join a team, it's totally different. Front end in a real company is very different than front end as one person who's doing the design, who's you know writing all the CSS and all the JavaScript um, versus if you are a front end engineer at a huge company, someone's giving you designs. Uh, you might be working on a really tiny piece of the front end. You could be working on CSS and implementing layouts, or you could be a full-time React developer. That's all considered front end. Uh, so you kind of have to just get on the job to figure it out. It's good to 
have an, a preference up front or, or to pursue one thing um, if you feel like you enjoy it or you identify it uh, or identify with it. But it is kind of one of those things. It's like when you're when I was 18 and I had to declare a major, I had no idea and I totally was wrong with what I did declare. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, there's less pressure, I guess, but it still felt like a lot of pressure to figure it out. Uh, it's kind of the same deal. When you're a brand new engineer, you don't really know what you're doing. Not that anybody does, but there's a lot of room to be wrong and make mistakes, try things out, learn new technologies. But once you get a job, you have the right boss, or you have sort of the right system around you, you should be able to figure it out. You should be able to explore. Not every company is going to give you the flexibility to just try a million things, but a lot of companies will. That's kind of part of the expectations of, of what it's like to be a developer. Um, and you'll know relatively quickly if you're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> if you really don't enjoy back end, you'll probably know in a couple of weeks of doing it. Uh, I know that's not very helpful, though. People want to hear, like, you definitely should do front end or definitely back end. Uh, I think front end is an approachable place to start. That's the only reason I start with it when I teach. You kind of need to have some something visual to make. Um, so I start with HTML and CSS and JavaScript. But I don't know. I, if there was a compelling way to start with only backend stuff, I would do it because that's really where students hit a, hit a wall more so. It's just hard to make that engaging when there's nothing to look at. That's the honest answer. Um, all right. So moving on to some other questions here. Uh, Somebody's, there's a couple asking about the Springboard Bootcamp and just giving you a quick update on that. And I think most of you know me probably from Udemy, um, but uh, it's now been a, a year and a half roughly since we en enrolled students. It's been a couple of well, less than a year since our first graduates, um, but I have some brief numbers. I can just tell you, you know, it's a job guaranteed bootcamp. Um, we haven't had to give anybody money back yet. So every single graduate has gotten a job. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of numbers here, but I'll say uh, so far students are getting an average salary increase of $24,000. Um, students are working at Google, IBM, Nike, tons of small companies, Slack. Uh, so pretty exciting, uh, you know, just to watch and be a part of. It's very different than in-person boot camps I've, I've led and it's very different than Udemy. Uh, totally not for everyone, but if you have any interest or you're considering uh, doing something serious and that's, you know, full time, it's also hard because I know so much of my audience is international and currently it's mostly the only, the job guarantee portion is only for Canadian students and students in the U.S. But if you fit in one of those buckets and you want to learn more, uh, I can definitely chat more about it, but also uh, at the end and in the description, there's also a link if you want to check it out and there's a promo code. But things have been going well there. I mean, honestly, I'll tell you, I was kind of freaked out because of COVID, like everyone, what that would mean for the job guarantee and would there be jobs and how would it, for the first time in my life, like, you know, having a stake in students having to get jobs. There's really no other outcome that was allowable. <laughs> students had to get jobs or uh, we were completely screwed. And uh, so I was pretty panicked, but things have gone very well. As you, I mean, I said 100% of students so far, no refunds, um, which exceeded my expectations even pre-COVID. Anyway, um, next question here is about learning online uh, versus learning in person. Um, no degree, this person says, as somebody who is only learning online, no degree or relevant work experience, how long should I expect my job search to go? Ah, uh, wow. I can't tell you a number, uh, depends on the market, depends on your skill set, depends on your, your resume. I'll say this, um, not to just keep coming back to Springboard, but there's a reason we have a six month window for the job search after students graduate. We allocate six months uh, to make sure that they get a job within that six months. And I'm not sure what the average number is, but it's definitely not you know a week. It takes time, even for the most talented students, um, even in places like the Bay Area, years ago when there was fewer boot camps, fewer graduates and tons of demand, students couldn't get a job overnight. Some of the best students I, I've ever had in person, they still took a month, sometimes two months, maybe even longer. Um, There's a couple students I know went right up to that six month deadline uh, and then they got a job. And it doesn't have anything to do with their skill level. Interviews are just such a weird thing. 
but it's also about timing. And a lot of companies have different hiring cycles, things line up with the quarterly cycle of the year. So it's not easy to say exactly how long, but I would give yourself longer than you probably would want and longer than you would expect, uh, especially when you're you know, online, if you're in a smaller market, if you don't have a strong resume with other experience, um, it's hard, but it takes time and uh, it takes probably floundering on some interviews. Uh, give yourself some credit, even when you do screw up, if you do screw up and you fail an interview or something goes poorly, that's part of the process. Uh, like I said, we give our students six months just to get that first job. Um, and that's with a career coach, that's with a mentor, that's with like scrutinizing resumes and giving feedback and doing mock interviews. So if you're on your own, I would even give yourself longer, which I wish I could say, a, you know, a shorter answer or a shorter time period, but that's kind of the, the reality of, of any job search. It's difficult. It's not, you know, it's, it's not a fun process to be honest, <laughs> but um, on either end, hiring is not really fun either, um, at least for me. Uh, which that reminds me, some of you probably know that I actually am hiring somebody. Um, I am currently reviewing thousands of uh, applications. I was not expecting as many. Um, I'll send an email or a YouTube video. I'm not sure how I'm going to communicate this, but I'm reviewing all of them. It's taking kind of forever uh, because I am an idiot and didn't realize just how, how many people would actually go through the entire process that I laid out. I thought it was going to uh, gonna narrow down the field, but there's a lot of applicants. So I'm working my way through that. Um, everybody, if you're in this chat and you've submitted an application, I am reading it. I'm reading every single one of the decks of slides and every single one of the resumes and the LinkedIn's, um, but it's gonna take me a couple more weeks. So just know that. Uh, okay, so another question here is around uh, mentorship. Um, working with people in software engineering careers, having a mentor. Uh, I would say, well, the question says, can you talk about having a mentor? Is it important and where can I find one? Uh, I'd say overall, it's a very underrated part of learning to code, especially when you're on your own. Um, if I wish I had a mentor when I was starting out for sure. Uh, my, <laughs> I think I've talked about this, I've le I learned to code not doing web stuff. I was a kid. My dad bought this little robotics kit home. Very simple stuff. Um, neither of us knew what we were doing. He was not an engineer. He's not a developer. He knew no code. And we both just kind of like fumbled through it. And there was no one to turn to. We had a book, but there was nobody to ask questions to. This was really before there was a lot of internet resources as well. Now, when I have a question, I mean, my first thing that I'll look up or I'll, that I'll turn to is the internet and try and find an answer. But there's a lot of times where you can find an answer, but that doesn't really explain or it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy you. Or you don't feel like you know why. You don't feel like you have direction. That happens to me uh, all the time where I could copy and paste something and it works great, my tests pass, but I'm still kind of confused about what the hell just happened or why that works. And that is where it's great to have someone you can turn to who is a person, who is not just you know, a Stack Overflow post or a piece of documentation, but somebody who you can actually ask a question to. Um, and for me, that's kind of the role a mentor plays. I don't, I don't have somebody that I would call my mentor today, but I have many people that I reach out to that are my <laughs> friends slash uh, code readers and just like debugging buddies who are there uh, to be a person because you often need a person as, as much as we can do on Google. and. Uh, and that's especially important, I think, when you're starting out. You have so many questions. I mean, the students that I've worked with in person, um, the reason that they're taking a boot camp in person or online and paying sometimes a lot of money um, is to have questions answered, to be able to be part of a community, to interact with people. You absolutely can learn this stuff on your own. You don't have to have a mentor. You don't have to pay thousands of dollars. But there's a reason there's a whole industry around it. Um, and I kind of am somebody who's on both sides, right? You can buy a course or get a coupon for a course for nine bucks, or it used to be on Udemy, like even five bucks for some of these courses. And you could do that and people get jobs. Uh, not everybody, I, the vast majority don't even make it 60 hours through the course, which I, I don't blame them. That's, you know, there's no accountability. Um, nobody's making sure that you're doing everything, right? There's nothing, there's no structure. 
Then on the other side of it, you've got boot camps that are tens of thousands of dollars sometimes, in-person boot camps, or we can talk about Springboard, an online self-paced program. Same idea though, where you are paying money to sort of ensure your outcome, but also to have structure, to have a mentor or to have somebody who is answering your questions, not just teaching assistance, but uh, also a mentor who is going to, oh geez, I did not put my computer, on do not disturb. All right, go away. Okay. I knew I forgot something. Um, where was I? Yeah, mentors, important. Doing stuff online on your own, definitely doable, harder, uh, cheaper. <laughs> it's, it's really like there's a whole spectrum here. Uh, but mentors, if you can find one, it just somebody on your own even, finding another friend, they don't have to be a mentor, but somebody else on a chat group, somebody else in a meetup group, they can be a peer and there's a lot of value in that as well. So if you are somebody who's really just looking for a job and, and kind of lost, um, and you feel like you have a rough technical understanding of things, I would highly recommend that you try and find somebody else who is at a similar level to you or above even um, and meet up with them online or in person, ask questions, debug things, build something together. There's only so much you can learn on your own. That is super important, learning the technical stuff. But then there's a whole bunch to learn once you get your first job or once you work with somebody. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I used to do a lot with my in-person students was actually have group projects. And it's a nightmare. It's really painful and annoying for students to work in a group after doing everything on their own, but they learn a lot. They always come out saying it was, you know, the best projects they made. It's also the week that has like the most tears and frustrations, <laughs> but it's, a, it's also the week where students really learn the most. Um, and uh, it's, it's hard. It's definitely not a pleasant experience in the first couple of days when people have to work together. But if you can find a way to facilitate that and hopefully not have tears, but if you can find a way to facilitate a project or a meetup group or just a person that you turn to that you have a relationship with and you can ask questions to, that is really critical. There are, you know, Springboard uh, comes with mentors. You'll get a one-on-one -on -one mentor who meets with you the entire time throughout your however many months you take, six, seven, eight, nine months. Um, there are other programs as well. You can pay by the hour for code mentors. I'm not associated with them, but there are programs where you can find somebody and pay them. I don't know by the minute, I think is how it works. Um, or find a peer, find somebody who's volunteering. I, I highly recommend trying to go down that pathway. If you can, you, if you can do it, it's a lot to coordinate. It's a lot to figure out, but it's really, really beneficial. Um, let's see another question here from Sharon or, Shiran, um, how to prepare for the technical interview uh, for your first job? Oh, the first technical interview. Uh, very, obviously, a very intimidating topic for a lot of people. Stressful, uh, high anxiety, lots of, you know, high stakes. Um, but I think there's a couple things. Obviously, there's a technical preparation the learning and, and reminding yourself of the common questions, the common things that come up, data structures, algorithms, this, this stuff everyone hates or a lot of people hate. Um, I have a course on that, you know, and, and uh, I'd say it gets the most, in, it doesn't get the most enrollments. It gets relative to the number of people who never open it, it gets the most enrollments. Uh, so that was a really, really bad way of saying Lots of people know they should watch that course or take that course, but then they drop out or they don't even open it because it's kind of bland. It's not very exciting. Um, I enjoy making that content actually and teaching data structures, but it's a pain point for students. Uh, so that's one piece of advice everyone says, you know, do the data structures, learn the like common interview stuff that comes up. The second thing is the kind of mental psychological aspect of, of not freaking out, <laughs> um, of having strategies for coping when you don't know the answer. And how do you sort of like, how, how do you give them as much as you know and speculate even without coming across as somebody who knows nothing? You can, you can still get a job without getting the question right. In fact, many of the questions and in interviews are written in such a way that they're not expecting you to finish it. It might take three hours and they're gonna give you 30 minutes. Um, so there's like a whole psychological aspect of of managing your own expectations, communicating. Um, and that goes along with the third piece, which is doing mock interviews. So 
in all the boot camps that I've done in person, the springboard program online, there's an emphasis on mock interviews of doing demos of putting you under a situation that it's not as high stress. The stakes are much lower because you know, you're not getting a job from it. It's not going to change your life if you do well or not, but still simulating that and getting you used to it makes a really big difference. I don't have anything like that, you know, for my Udemy students. Um, but that's another thing I would recommend if, you know, if you're not interested or you don't have the time uh, or it just doesn't work out for you to enroll in a fancy expensive boot camp, very understandable. But one of the things they have, like I said, uh, it, it's mock interviews. It's just something that is, is really beneficial. Um, but you can organize that on your own. You can have mock interviews. There are question sets that you can find online. And if you find someone uh, that is willing to sort of do a Zoom call with you or a meetup group, it helps if they're technical, obviously, and they know the content, but they don't have to be an expert. Um, it's more about just putting yourself in that situation of having to come up with answers, of having to rack your brain and worry about the clock ticking down. And wh what do you do to fill those gaps of silence? You're not saying anything. Are you completely lost? Are you thinking? Uh, there's all these things that it's just so different when there's somebody else there um, and there's somebody else watching or judging you or potentially judging you. It's just different. So as much practice as you can get always helps. So I know that's kind of a lot. <laughs> I, again, it's not another one of those things. There's a reason we have six months for students to get jobs. Um, six months is still not that long, but we expect students to not do well on an interview or two and learn from it and bounce back. It happens. I mean, I've totally bombed interviews, both technical and non-technical interviews. There's been times I uh, maybe aced them or at least felt like I did and it went well and it worked out. But there's been a couple of times I can think of at least one that was just humiliating. Uh, so that's just part of it too. It's going to happen. It happens. I'm not the best of us. It happens to the best of us. Uh, it's people who are far more talented developers. Um, let's see. Some other questions here. Uh, is being a mechanical engineering or driver or waiter or anything, I think it's, it's beca is being a mechanical engineer or driver or, or waiter or anything else that far from web dev um, and will it impact me trying to find a job? So I think this person is asking around, uh, you know, background and what, what kind of background do you need or what helps? Um, I don't really think there's much in, in terms of uh, a correlation or, I, don't, I haven't noticed any trends where, you know, people who have a math background or an art background or a teaching background or police or whatever end up having a better career um, or have more success or, or learn things faster. The majority of, I mean, students that I've worked with, they just come from all backgrounds, honestly, uh, especially in the online world. But even in in-person programs, we're talking about moms who are going back to work. We're talking about military vets, policemen, firemen, but also engineers, high school students, uh, landscapers, people who worked in coffee shops, people who ran their own business. It's all over the place, teachers. Um, so I wouldn't say there's really a trend there. Maybe there's a connection, and I can think of some students definitely where there's a connection to the soft skills part of things, the uh, being able to communicate and get a job and, and sort of talk about yourself. That part is separate from the technical skills, but I definitely notice people who come from a, a teaching background or a retail background or from a sales background, although not all, there's a couple of students like, well, I won't, I won't go into detail, uh, but people who are used to having to deal with people and talk to people and, you know, that can, that can have an impact when you're interviewing or something, you know, when you're starting out, but it's really uh, negligible and that can be picked up anyway. Uh, in terms of technical requirements, I haven't noticed any anything at all. Um, otherwise, I mean, I don't know if I would tell you if I did, to be honest, <laughs> if I noticed that, you know, uh, art, art teachers ended up being the best candidates who got jobs the fastest. I don't think it would be very helpful to know that because the majority of you probably are not art teachers. But anyway, um, I haven't noticed that. <laughs> uh, what else here? How to stay motivated in learning web development. Uh, uh, sometimes I feel like I need to know that secret. Um, just like with anything, 
web development, maybe more than anything, changes so fast and just continues to go on and on and on. You're always going to feel like you're behind the curve. And I certainly feel that way. I see, you know, Udemy instructors putting out courses every week on topics that I don't know. And it's like, you know, I, shoot, I'm over here trying to learn one of these topics. And this person has put out like two courses on completely different topics I don't know in that time span. Um, it is definitely sometimes challenging. I'll, you know, there's like motivation, I guess. There's also just trying to not get discouraged. Um, maybe they're the same, like two sides of the same coin. But I'd say like personally, I am motivated all the time to try and stay on top of things to try and you know continue and I enjoy coding and web development, but it's easy to, to feel discouraged about being, um, like I said, behind the curve or being you know late to the game on a certain technology. Things change so fast. You can invest six months in whatever, React, and then, uh, or I'll give you an example. I spent a lot of time learning Ember years ago, and then it kind of just went away. Um, and I was kind of irritated for a little bit because I wanted to make a course on Ember. And now, you know, it's React and, and Angular and Vue and React and Angular at least have been around for quite a long time. There was a period where things are changing even faster. And I'm sure if you give it five years, there'll be plenty of new things anyway. But in terms of staying motivated, I kind of tell you about my <laughs> struggles at times uh, because it is easy to, to feel behind. But you just have to remember, like, that's just how it goes. That's what everyone's doing. There's people who have spent five years learning React and becoming React experts on the job. And then their boss might ask them or move them to a small team the next month, or usually you're not just gonna be moved to like against your will, but you might be working on a project on something completely different. And that can be a fun challenge. That can be a good thing that, you know, you have to just remember you're not expected to be a master of everything. Sometimes I kind of feel like I'm supposed to do that because I'm like this teacher and I'm supposed to come from this place of knowledge and of knowing it all, but that's like complete BS. Uh, I'm still just trying to pick things up in the same way anyone else does. And it even feels faker at times coming from me because I know I'm still just a learner. And, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have the luxury of spending five years with every single topic that I'm going to teach. If I want to make a course on Angular, you know, I guess I've been using Angular on and off for a while, but I'm not, it's not the same as an Angular developer who's been writing it nonstop for five years. Um, so you just have to like kind of view it as a challenge. And that's the flip side of it is that you always have something new to do. Yes, it would be nice if you just mastered it all and it was done, but that'd also be really boring. So whenever I feel like, you know, some new update comes around and ruins some course I just released, which has happened as you probably know, uh, like with my React course, oh man, um, when I released that, hooks were like still in beta and we we're supposed to be out like, you know, a couple of, sometime in, at the end of the year. And then all of a sudden everyone wanted hooks and the entire course I just made was like completely useless and a waste of four to five months of my time. Um, that sort of thing is frustrating and that's unique, obviously making a course on something like it's in order to sell, it has to be up to date, but you can kind of think of it, you know, your skill set in the same way is going to go out of date. And part of the challenge and part of what keeps us interesting is that you've got to just keep going and, and figure out what the next thing that you should learn is. And also I think the best way to stay motivated is to just narrow your focus instead of looking at, you know, 10 different directions, You've got all these different new things. Next JS, are you going to learn TypeScript? Are you going to learn WebAssembly? Are you going to learn uh, what else am I missing? You know, Vue. Are you going to learn Gatsby? All these different things, and I named what five, and there's probably dozens and dozens that you guys could come up with. Just pick one or two and just go down the rabbit hole. You'll learn something instead of spending an hour on twenty things. You're not going to learn enough really to be an expert in any of it. But it's far more valuable. Uh, to build skills, at least that's my opinion, to have depth in a, a few places instead of just a really broad set, especially when you're starting out. It's You're more marketable if you can prove that you're actually an expert in something instead of that you know like 20% of 10 different languages. It's just not that marketable. So that's the other thing I'd say to stay motivated is just pick a narrow focus and try and stay on that and don't get distracted. 
it happens. I mean, I, <laughs> if you could see the tabs I have open on my computer right now, Chrome is so angry all the time with me. Um, but I probably have like 20 different tutorials and blog posts on five, six different languages and different technologies that I'm trying at different times to return to, but most of the time it just stays minimized and I'm trying to focus on one and just keep going on one because uh, it's just impossible. Um, so that's a long way of saying it's not gonna go away. Even if you get that first job, maybe it's not as important. You don't feel like you have to stay on top of things all the time, but you are gonna be left behind at some point and you are gonna have to keep learning. Companies, a lot of companies give their employees like a, a learning day um, at least in the Bay Area, one out of five days, you, or maybe half a day, some companies, you're supposed to be enriching yourself, learning more about some tool, some language, because they know you need to stay sharp. You need to stay on top of things. And it's really hard to do that if you're working full time. Anyway, whew, uh, let's see. I kind of just addressed another question, which is how can someone combat imposter syndrome? That's another one, that, you know, somebody asked, um, and it's, that's a hard one. The, the real answer is you get a job and you do work and you get performance reviews and eventually you realize, okay, I guess either everybody around me is delusional or I know what I'm doing or I know enough. Um, not everyone has, you know, I think imposter syndrome sometimes gets blown up a little too much uh, and it scares people or makes them feel like, you know, you're going to feel no matter what, no matter how good you are or confident, like you're going to have a reason to feel like you're an imposter or that you you don't know your stuff. And for a lot of students, that absolutely is the case. There's just this irrational, you know, like you feel like you're insecure or not good enough. You don't know what you're doing. You're joining. Uh, people feel that when they like join a new friend group or they move cities. It's not just changing careers. That's very natural. But I think most of it goes away with some confidence uh, that you gain from just getting a job or getting positive feedback from making something work, fixing your first ever uh, bug or your first ever you know, task that you've been assigned. Those snowball and over time you get more comfortable. But I know plenty of very talented developers who are senior and they're experts, but when they change jobs, they still go back to almost square one in terms of their psychology they feel insecure and inferior they feel like they don't belong at this company they, they don't know the stack and that's definitely just like personal you know different people's brains and how they work but then they work their way back up and you gain that confidence with time so some of it is just down to the type of person you are some of it is down to the experience you have on the job and then some of it is down to just getting your own brain under control and reminding yourself it's very normal to feel bad about this or to feel worried or insecure but with enough time and enough practice, it will go away. Or at least, maybe not go away, but you can shut it up a little bit. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I'll do maybe one more question here. Um, oh, some questions about blockchain, Web 3.0, Ether uh, from a student named Mikhail, I think. Uh, <laughs> I wish I was more qualified on those topics to, to really talk about them. I mean, that's one of the, I mentioned all these tabs I have open. One group of those tabs, like four or five tabs is about uh, just uh, actually a couple of things, but um, web 3.0 and, and different uh, programming languages and web assembly and something called near another one called uh, what is it? Salinity um, where I am not an expert at all. And it is honestly overwhelming sometimes how much there is to learn about that stuff, but it, I find it fascinating. I'm probably personally not gonna be making a course anytime soon uh, in the next couple of months at least. Uh, I know there are courses coming out on that. Um, although anytime there's like, you know, a big, I guess there's only two or three I can think of where there's been a big uh, rise of interest in crypto, usually correlating to Bitcoin and now Ether just having uh, massive spikes in price. There's always more courses coming out on those topics. And I don't know if there's any, if they're any good or not. Uh, and then it kind of quiets down whenever there's a bit of a dip, like happened a couple of, what, a month ago or so. And maybe we're still in the middle of, I, I am not a crypto guy beyond being interested in the, 
uh, the inner workings of how things function and teaching sort of the technical part I enjoy, but I'm not, you know, a, some guy who's going around telling you investment advice. I, I wish I had that kind of insight, <laughs> but I would be completely BSing you if I was uh, trying to, to predict anything. But I do think there's going to be a lot more courses and a lot more stuff happening in that area, not just in education, not just courses. But um, my understanding right now and talking to a couple of people is that there's a lot of promise in what can be done with these tools with Web 3.0. Um, but there's not a lot of like proof. There's not a lot of real usable products, things that have that are useful just yet. There's a lot of demos. There's a lot of speculation. I think another year or two, we'll probably see things that are more tangibly useful and to the average person or the average developer makes sense to, to go and learn and go use. For me, not really, yeah, I guess I'd say I'm the average developer and, and somebody who's kind of looking ahead just as a teacher often, um, it still seems like a hard pitch to students. It seems like a topic where I'm not sure I could get in front of students and say, this is why you need to know this. I could say this is why it's interesting and it probably will be useful in a couple of years and there'll be more jobs. But right now I just don't know um, if I would say it is, you know, something I would recommend everyone learn unless you're interested in it. Um, okay. So uh, I think for now, that's going to be a wrap. Thanks everyone for joining me here. Uh, lots of questions. Um, I know I've been in just, a couple hundred or more have come in in the last 45 minutes. Uh, definitely only answered like 10 or 15 of them, but um, doing my best here and trying to sort of collate them down into similar topics. Um, as you know, uh, I think I did mention, uh, well, you probably don't care. I, I have a Udemy students so that just passed a million students. You can check out coupons and all of that uh, in an announcement that I sent out. But uh, I also want to tell you about, you know, the Springboard program that I've got, uh, the job guaranteed one. Yeah, I always feel like such a great marketing salesman here, like I'm in an infomercial. Uh, but I am honestly, as I said, really excited and happy with how this turned out. 100% of our students have been placed, uh, or rather 100% of graduates uh, have been placed and have not got a job refund or a refund on their tuition, which is the whole agreement. You don't get a job, you don't pay. Uh, and obviously that sucks if you are the business having to pay a bunch of students who don't get jobs. So things have been going well, uh, as I said, uh, and so far 100% success rate. So if you're interested, again, I know it's not everybody. It is uh, a big time commitment. It's also, currently it is open to people from a, a bunch of different job markets. However, we only have that job guarantee for US and can uh, Canada students. But if you do wanna go down that road, if you wanna learn more, uh, there is a coupon in the description here. You can use the Colt AMA, C-O-L-T-A-M-A uh, coupon to get $1,000 off the, the course. Remember, you don't pay unless you get a job. Uh, so check it out if you're curious. You can also, again, find me on YouTube, as you already know because you're here, or find me on Udemy uh, and on Facebook. I, was, I did a Facebook AMA a couple days ago. Uh, so it's been nice chatting one directionally at you. Um, I wish there was a better way to do something a bit more interactive where some of you could pop up on video or something and, and uh, make me feel a little bit less awkward just talking to my camera. But it's been nice uh, seeing some of the nice comments from you guys. And uh, next time I will grab some of my cats and chickens and humiliate them in front of the camera for you. Uh, and everyone else have a nice day. And uh, that's it. All right. Bye, everyone.